from NBC5, this is the NBC5 News at 10. On NBC5 Exclusive, the chairman of Metro resigns amid a patronage scandal. The interview you can only see here. Nightmare on a bus. First, it's in an accident on the way to Chicago. Wait till you find out what happens next. And safety alert in the suburbs. Three men attack a family in a park and steal their car. Good evening. I'm Dick Johnson. And for Rob Stafford. And I'm Allison Rosati. Tonight, NBC5 investigates the scandal at Metra. We have more information on a story we broke on our news at 5 o'clock. The embattled chairman of Metra tells us he is resigning. It comes amid the scandal over patronage politics at the agency. Tonight, Brad O'Halloran explains his decision and defends himself. We'll report on what the resignation means for the board and how it affects the 300,000 people who ride Metra every day. Let's begin with NBC 5's Phil Rogers and his exclusive interview. Phil? Allison Brad O'Halloran had become the public face of the entire Metra mess, alternately portrayed as either the hero or the villain. He told me today it simply had to stop. I have to think of what's best for Metra, not what's best for Brad O'Halloran. And what's best for Metra is right now. In his for letter me. of resignation, it appears Mr. Clifford has emerged in a much more advantageous position, even though he apparently had no qualms about pushing for and taking so much money. I look forward to the next chapter of my life, but, um, you know, and I wish everyone well. O'Halloran did take one other shot in his departure. While I have been taking the heat, he said, it seems the powerful politicians Mr. Clifford accused escape the same level of criticism. And if people want to see it, and they should watch it, the entire interview will be on our website, NBCChicago.com. People might be wondering what happens on the Metro board now. Who's left? That's a wonderful question. You know, now they are down to eight people, but it takes eight votes to pick a real chairman. So that would have to be unanimous. And if they lose just two more members, the Metro board won't have a quorum, and apparently they would not be able to even meet. Phil, thank you. And as you know, tonight Metro tells us riders won't see any changes, but insiders tell us the patronage scandal has slowed efforts to improve operations, and that includes a plan to restore the 10 ride discount, to work to reduce chronic delays on some lines, achieving ticket unity with the CTA, and making Wi Fi available on trains. Stay with NBC5 and NBCChicago.com for continuing coverage of the Metro scandal. We're working on another developing story tonight. A nightmare ride finally ends this evening for a bus full of people. It's safe to say they'll never forget their trip from Toronto to Chicago. First, the bus was involved in a crash with a truck in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Then the trip to Chicago was delayed when the replacement bus broke down twice. NBC5's Natalie Martinez is live at the Greyhound bus station for us, and they must be tired and frustrated, Natalie. They are, Allison. They're tired. They're banged up. Some of them seriously injured. They're exhausted. Since 1 a.m., these passengers have dealt with one catastrophe after another. Now they're finally here several hours late. This is totally passengers like Robert. <laughs> We have tried to reach Greyhound all day, all night by phone. We have not gotten a call back. Neither has our affiliate in Kalamazoo. We are live at the West Loop. Greyhound, Natalie Martinez, NBC5 News. Dick and Allison. Thanks, Natalie. Tonight, police search for three suspects who held up a family at a suburban park. It happened Tuesday night at Atcher Park in Schaumburg. Police are saying a 36-year-old man was playing with his four children when a young man wearing a gray hooded sweatshirt walked up and asked to use his cell phone. A remarkable scene in a courtroom today. A victim makes a very dramatic statement. Still ahead, she comes face to face with the man who held her and two other women hostage for a decade. What she said to him. Then a developing story, a terror threat puts American embassies on high alert. And later, our weather computer models are disagreeing tonight on what to expect this weekend. Brant Miller has the latest thinking. Let's start our days off better. Let's get answers to what's happening now. Let's try and predict the unpredictable and find out where life gets congested. Up to the minute, the minute you're up. NBC5 News Today. A diplomatic crisis with Russia tonight after it grants asylum to Edward Snowden. Russia gave the NSA leaker a travel document that allows him to live there for at least a year. The decision came despite a personal appeal from President Obama. Tonight, the White House says he is outraged. 
Here in Illinois, Democratic candidate for governor Bill Daley takes on Cardinal Francis George over gay marriage. The archdiocese recently cut funding to immigrant rights groups that support gay marriage, uh, and Daley criticizes wrong, that they, move. They saying, uh, Either you, you know, abide by the original agreement, in which case you get the money, or you don't, in which case you don't. So it's a very sorry thing because uh, these are good groups, and we'd like to continue funding. The candidate Daly says he respects the Cardinal, but doesn't always agree with him. Still ahead, big doubts about the weekend weather forecast. Brant's going to be here to sort it all out. Plus, NBC5 investigates a championship peewee football team takes on the Chicago Park District. Carol Marine has that story. And a new mall wants your business so badly, it's willing to pay to get you there. We're back in 60 seconds. Libertyville-based Motorola goes after the iPhone with its new Moto X smartphone. Motorola and Google designed it so voice commands do just about anything, and buyers can customize their phone in many ways. The starting price, just under $200. Tonight on NBC5 Investigates follow-up, we recently reported on a dispute between a peewee football team, the Shabona Saints, and the Chicago Park District. At issue, the district's decision to bar them from Shabona Park. Last night, the Saints were back, and our Carol Marine was there. There were sit-ups, push-ups, and drills galore as the Shabona Saints football... And cheerleading squads return to their home of 40 years. We are going to be practicing right here. I don't plan on leaving these fields anymore. It's been a contentious past 12 months for the team and its supporters who were told earlier this year they could no longer use Shabona Park. The park district cited a history of, among other things, quote, failing to obtain proper insurance. But team coaches and parents say that's not the real reason the Saints were kicked out of this park. They just don't want us to be here. The team has evolved over the years from mostly Italian neighborhood kids to a mix of black, white, and Hispanic. Vaughn Bryant is the chief program officer of the Chicago Park District, and when asked if the Saints are an honorable organization, he replied, I, I can't make that call. All I can say is that they haven't been in compliance with what we we're asking for. Including, says Bryant, the required insurance for a sport in which injuries occur. The copy we have, we have had it vetted, and it's it's not something that we can accept. But the Saints say the insurance policy they have is the same one used by teams at other fields. But there's multiple parks that actually have the same insurance. And 36th Ward Alderman Nick Spazzato says he thinks the insurance is up to date as well. I believe they have valid insurance, so I believe that's a non-issue right now. So right now, everybody give him a big hand. Spazzato was hailed by coaches, parents, and kids this week as the person who made this practice possible again. If they weren't out in this field, would there be anybody else on this field tonight? No, it would be a ghost town like it's been for the past two weeks. So would that make any sense to you that the Shavona Saints would not be allowed to play? Oh, absolutely not. None of this made any sense to me. The dispute traveled all the way to City Hall and a meeting with the mayor's office, the park district, the Saints, and the aldermen. We had to talk with the mayor, and I appreciate his support on this, and I believe it's a big reason why this is resolved. Well, not exactly resolved, but the team was on the field this week, and cheerleaders who won a national championship last year were there, too, hard at work. Issues remain to be worked out for the 2013 season, but for the Saints, as of now, it's no longer fourth down and long. Carol Marine, NBC5 News. No. Good update on that yeah, story. Yeah, they're all and out being active, right? It was a perfect night to just get outside Beautiful. and play. It's a gorgeous night. There are already some showers beginning to pop up to our north and west. We'll give you a, a quick look at the weekend forecast. Uh, nothing's really changed significantly. Still a chance of showers and thunderstorms tomorrow. 78 the high temperature. Saturday, maybe some showers early in the morning and then drifting southward, 75 the high. Sunday, dry conditions and temperatures around 77. The concern is Lollapalooza. Uh, take a look now at our live Doppler 5. And there's one area of showers out toward Joe Davies County. That's just been popping up. There's been some lightning associated with that. That's all drifting off to the south and east. So overnight tonight, a chance of showers and thunderstorms. Here's where temperatures stand at this hour. Still on the warm side, 69 at O'Hare, 72 at Midway Airport. Overnight tonight, uh, we'll drop off into the 60s. And then tomorrow, around 10 o'clock in the morning, we start to recover back into the 70s, into the noon hour. And then the high temperature tomorrow in the upper 70s. So 
a warm summer-like day, not as cold as it's been. Uh, here's what we're seeing with a satellite image. This is a large area of moisture that's uh, pinwheeling around a system that's sitting to the south, and that's working toward Chicago. Still, the upper atmospheric winds are dragging this stuff from the north and west off to the south and east. So you see some of those thunderstorms up there beginning to pop up. Now, here's the dilemma. This is the high-resolution computer model we use in Stormcast. It's showing showers zipping across. There we go into the early morning hours, and then more showers popping up as we move throughout the day. And a lot of this staying to the south. Now, the second model, which is starting to get into a little more agreement what, what some of the new information is saying tonight, is painting a lot more moisture. Now, this doesn't have the high resolution, the small grid spacing that the other one does, but it shows significant moisture sliding across Chicago and especially the south suburbs. Here comes Saturday morning, and all of that drifts off to the south, and we dry out for the rest of the weekend. Looks great. Temperatures on the cool side, and even into Sunday, we'll wind up with uh, sunshine for Chicago, maybe a few fair weather clouds. So the big question is, which model is really going to nail tomorrow? And unfortunately, it's one of those situations that we have to wait until tomorrow. Andy will have the latest information beginning at 4.30. And especially if you're headed out to Lollapalooza, keep in mind there could be some lightning associated with this weather system. Becoming cloudy, showers and storms developing late tonight, 64. For tomorrow, expect temperatures to climb to the upper 70s, mostly cloudy, a chance of showers and thunderstorms. West winds around 10 to 15. If you're headed to Lollapalooza, keep your guard up tomorrow. Uh, into the weekend, things become a little more tame. Some showers early on Saturday, dry conditions on Sunday. More storms move in late Monday into the middle part of next week. Anytime you want weather, here's how you connect with us. Just log on to NBCChicago.com or check out these addresses on social media for the latest forecast information. Now, Grant's weather photos. The corn crop in Kane County. Remember last year when we had all the, the drought situation? Yes, yeah. about half that size. Way Look past knee high by the 4th yeah. of July. Yeah, it's way way past it. Uh, Twitter, you can send your pictures to that address. And this is an amazing photograph. Uh, this is hmm. a digger wasp. Jeez. It excavates a hole, drags its prey into it, and goes down in there. And Isn't that creepy? That yes, is creepy. it is, Brant. Thank looks, you. It looks now alien. people are going to have nightmares. <laughs> Especially when digger it's... Digger wasp. No. Thank, Thank you, you Brad. Time for sports. Mike Adamley has a new tie as well. <laughs> Love that tie, Michael. Yeah, thank you. You know, we got another question for you. What happens when the Bears meet zebras for the first time in training camp? And what happens when young talent meets opportunity? In the case of the Cubs, it's a different kind of lake effect. We've got highlights coming up next in sports. Now, the Toyota Sports Desk. The Toyota August sales event is going on now. Toyota, let's go places. Well, with the trade deadline behind them, the Cubs began a four-game series tonight against the Dodgers, who just happened to be the hottest team in baseball. L.A. 10-2 and two since the All-Star break. And you wonder if Carlos Marmol felt a little odd sitting in the opposing team's dugout after he had to swap his Cub pinstripes for Dodger Blue. You can't blame him for this. Junior Lake batting second, put the Cubs on top in the first inning. His first home run at Wrigley Field, a solo shot off of Ricky Nolasco. Next batter, next pitch, same result. Anthony Rizzo, home run number 17 for the Riz, good for a 2-0 lead. He would hit another one in the eighth. Dodgers tied it in the third, but the Cubs grabbed it right back. Junior like his first home run so much, he thought, why not? Hit another. He did. Cubs lost the lead in the sixth and ultimately the game, however, in the ninth. L.A. Super Slugger Yaziel Puig he gets all of this pitch by Hector Rondon. The Dodgers prevail 6-4, their 11th straight win on the road. Meanwhile, the White Sox trying to avoid a four-game sweep at the hands of the Indians, but these days even the Sox ace has struggled. Chris Sales lasted only five innings today, gave up five runs, ten hits. Ryan Rayburn's home run there in the third, the beginning of the end. In the seventh, Rayburn really crushed one. This one off of Dylan Axelrod. Sox lose their seventh in a row. They are now 26 games under the 500 mark for the first time since the Blues Brothers premiered here in Chicago, and the price of gas was 119 a gallon. We're talking 1980, folks. Well, despite practicing without a whole lot of contact work, the Bears continue to have their share of injuries. Today, defensive end. Corey Wooten tweaked his hip and was forced to leave practice. Mark Tressman called the injury day-to-day. -day. Now, with the Bears' first preseason game a week from tomorrow,
tomorrow against Carolina. Coach Mark Tressman decided that today would be a good time to practice with a full complement of officials on the field to simulate game conditions. Depending on what side of the football you were on, there were good calls and bad calls. Oh, get the out of here. He ran in me. Al Sean ran a double move, and I immediately went to the officials. Like, what were you calling that? Was that legal? And he gave me the BS answer, so I thought it was a completely legal play. It was awesome, man. Me and Peanut got into it the other day because he was holding. You know, we're tired of that, so uh, for the rest to be out here holding them accountable felt good. I guess that's why you saw some big plays. Healthy competition, I call it. <laughs> well, you don't have to love, don't you love the way the Hawks share the cup? Even though Dave Bolin was traded to the Maple Leafs just days after scoring the winning goal in game six, he still got his day with the cup in his hometown of Toronto, leading a parade atop an antique fire truck. You know what? The dream comes true again, again, yeah. and again, and we never get tired of it. And everybody can't wait to just see the cup. Yeah. I love it. Love it, love it, love it. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Still ahead. A Cubs player hits a home run with patients at a Chicago hospital. Finally tonight, I feel like I'm doing sports, but we're sending out a big high five to Chicago Cubs outfielder David DeJesus for brightening up the day of patients at Advocate Christ Medical Center in Oak Lawn. Now, he helped patients there forget about the medications for a while, and he just talked baseball. How fun. DeJesus signed autographs and even posed for pictures there. He also passed out Cubs gear mm. for fans. It They'll has be rooting for him. Such an impact on the patients when guys do that. It does. Allison, you got the job. <laughs> One night I'll do yours, you do mine. I'll okay, look at thanks. It. Now, Mike. That'll be interesting. <laughs> That's all for us tonight at 10. We'll stay on top of the news overnight. So start your day with us tomorrow morning at 4 30. Mike, you go ahead and keep doing sports. See you back here tomorrow. Go Montini. <laughs>